My name is Nathan Harvey. I manage web operations for a company called Custom Inc. Today I'd like to share with you some of the things that we're doing internally at Custom Inc. to help make the process of getting software out of the developers and into production and keep that uh, software running and just looking at how we smooth out the process. I'd like to start off with a very brief introduction to who Custom Inc. is. Uh, Custom Inc. is a website. You may have heard of us. We make it easy and fun to design custom t-shirts. We've got a great set of artwork and fonts that you can include on your custom design t-shirts. We ship it out to you for free. And we do all of this because we think that t-shirts make events awesome. T-shirts unite people together. Uh, and so I encourage you to come on to our site, order some t-shirts if you like. <clears throat> and see me afterwards, I've got discount codes if you're really interested. But I'm not really here to sell custom ink. Uh, just one more slide on us. Let me talk a little bit about the scale and the size of Custom Inc. We've been around since 1999. We have not been a rail shop for our entire history. You might know why. Uh, we get about 40 million requests to our app servers each week. Uh, and that's only to our app servers, right? Of course, there's a caching layer in front of that that's going to intercept a lot of those requests. But if I just look at New Relic very quickly, I can see that I easily hit 40 million mark each week. We've delivered shirts to over one million customers. If you're wearing a t-shirt today, there is a chance that we printed it for you. Uh, we've shipped over 25 million t-shirts. Yeah, we've got somebody back here uh, from the Pragmatic Studios with a t-shirt on from Custom Ink, all right. <clears throat> so let me take you back a little bit and tell you how things used to be at Custom Ink. Uh, so we used to have, excuse me, one team working on a few applications simultaneously. We would work in two-week sprints, and at the end of a sprint, the operations team, myself, would deploy the code out to production. Worked okay, except we did have some certain challenges with this. First of all, a lot of times the developers would work directly in the master branch. So they'd commit their code, they'd run into merge conflicts, they'd fix up their merge conflicts. Meanwhile, another developer has committed more code, so they commit theirs back with more merge conflicts. It's a real pain, just this cycle of resolving merge conflicts. Uh, we've gotten a lot smarter about how to use Git now. Uh, well, first we were on SVN, so uh, moving to Git made a big help with that. Uh, but then also small changes sat for days waiting to deploy. Uh, let's say we wanted to change the hours of our customer service, when, when we would accept calls, adjust it by an hour. We'd do that at the beginning of the sprint. The developer would say, well, it's done. I changed the code, the build passed, I'm done. That change sat in the queue for two weeks waiting to get deployed. Not really great. Deploys were often rolled back because we were deploying two weeks worth of changes at once, and some big feature maybe broke. Something was wrong with it in production. So we would have to roll the entire thing back. So now our customer service hours uh, are off again. Uh, and then the other challenge that we had is our team grew. So we got bigger than a few developers. We're now about 20 different developers working on a bunch of different applications. So you might have similar problems or challenges that we had if your deploys are like a high school prom. And what do I mean by that? Let's talk a little bit about the prom. A deploy is like a prom if it happens infrequently. So it happens every, once every two weeks, maybe once a month, maybe once a quarter. The buildup is always bigger than the result. So when you think about your deploys, what are the emotions that you have in your gut when you're leading up to that moment of deploy? For us, it was anxiety, it was fear, What's going to break? There, there was no excitement. It was, uh, it was not, not really great. There's lots of ceremony surrounding a prom, lots of ceremony surrounding a deploy. So for a prom, you've got to go out and buy flowers. You've got to get the whole family to come over in the yard and take pictures of you and your date and the dog. Uh, it's similar with our deploys, how our deploys used to be. Mass emails have to go out to the company. We're going to deploy a change to the customer service hours. Everybody be aware, something might break on the website. Uh, that's really not where you want to be. Some other indications of problems. Uh, your deploy is treated like all hands on deck. 
I would often feel like this guy at the control station. I'm sitting at my terminal, about to hit cap deploy, and we've got developers surrounding me, making sure that everything is going to go out okay. Now, they may not actually be hovering over my shoulder. We might all have to be together in a campfire room or something like that, but everyone knew the deploy is going out. This is a big deal. There were also, sadly, office pools for when the email would come out that say, yeah, we had to roll that one back. Uh, because that happened at least as frequently as we put out deploys. Uh, in fact, when I first joined Custom Inc., I was quickly known by everyone in the company as the guy who told them that we rolled back the code that we just deployed. Another indication of a problem, if at, at the end of a deploy, you're so happy and proud of your team that you consider ordering custom t-shirts for them to celebrate and mark the occasion. Uh, not something I recommend. However, if you do have a big project and you want to order some custom t-shirts, I happen to know a guy. So how can you fix this? Uh, the way that we fixed it is deploy early, deploy often. Uh, and this is not just a talk about continuous deployment, but this is a talk about what are the sort of challenges and changes that we needed to put in place so that we could get to a state where we are deploying early and deploying often. We wanted to move to a scenario, which is where we are today, where we deploy small independent changes. Deploys happen when they are ready. When the code is ready to go into production, it goes into production. It doesn't need to sit around and mature uh, or age. <clears throat> so the first thing we did was we redefined the process. Uh, we looked at done. From a developer's perspective, I'm done with this ticket when the code is written. The build passes, and I've marked it closed in JIRA. That's it. I'm done with that. We've changed the developer mindset to understand that done means that your code is now running in production. It's been verified in production. Everything looks good. That's when done is. We've also moved from two-week sprints to Kanban. Essentially, you take an item off of the list, and you work on it until it is done. You get it completely through to production. So there's a big emphasis on minimizing the amount of work and process. This ensures that we get stuff out there as quickly as possible. We also utilize our product managers to help us prioritize that queue. In order to move to this, on the operations side, we realized, working with the development team, that we needed an easy way for them to stage their changes. If you're going to do lots of independent, small changes, you need to get them verified by the business owner very quickly. In the past, we had one or two different staging environments. That simply wouldn't work. You would queue up to get into the staging environment so that you could get your hours change deployed. Didn't make sense. So we knew that we needed disposable servers. We needed a way to quickly spin up a staging environment, put new code onto that staging environment, have it verified by the business, everybody's good, that staging environment goes away, we no longer think about it, it doesn't exist anymore, the code moves on into production. We decided that each topic branch within our Git repo must have its own staging environment. And of course, we also decided that everything that you work on should be in its own topic branch. There's no longer a, an idea of working in master. So these short-lived branches really require short-lived staging environments. And the only way to get there is through automation. You have to automate the process of spinning up and tearing down staging environments. So we went on this journey of infrastructure as code. So you've maybe heard of this idea of infrastructure as code. Jesse Robbins from Ops Code sums it up pretty nicely. You can enable the reconstruction of your business from nothing but a source code repository, application data backup, and bare metal resources. How many of you can meet this in production today? All right, it's a small number, but good. The only way that you can do this, or the ways that you can do this, are through custom scripts. You can write up your own bash scripts or whatever. Uh, we definitely have done that in the past. Custom scripts work great with Capistrano because now I essentially have SSH in a for loop. I can do the same custom script on multiple machines. Of course, there are other more mature frameworks that allow you to do this, like CF Engine and Puppet. We happen to use Chef. So let's talk a little bit about Chef and how it works. So Chef is a systems integration or an infrastructure as code framework. And what you do is you come up with a specification or policy of the environment that you want to build out. 
So my environment maybe has a, a varnish server in front, a couple of web servers behind that, and, and then a database server uh, at the back end. So you define these resources, or you define this specification, and then you go into each one of them, and let's say my web server. It needs to have Apache installed, it needs to have a user account for each one of my developers, and so forth. Those things, the package, the users, those are resources that you abstract out. So you tell Chef, install Apache, configure Apache, add this user, and so forth. You take these resources and bundle them together into recipes. Those recipes get packaged up into cookbooks. So a cookbook is sort of analogous to a Ruby gem. You take a, a collection of instructions or a, a collection of chef commands, you package them together in a cookbook, you can share those with other chef users, and then you apply those cookbooks and recipes to your nodes. So those nodes are actually the servers, or a, a representation of your server. The nice thing about Chef, or one of the nice things about Chef, is you, you'll, of course, use it for provisioning, and that's easy to grok, right? You, you easily understand. It's quick to spin up a server with Chef. The other thing that you do, though, with Chef is it runs continually on those nodes. So if, down the line, you need to make a change to your environment, that change first gets checked into source code, it gets, goes into Git, then it gets applied to your nodes in production. So we're starting to get better. We're moving away from that horrible state that we were in. We've changed the process. We've automated for disposable servers. That had another really nice side effect for us. It enabled us to get developers up and running much faster when they came on board through the use of Vagrant. So Vagrant is an incredible gem that if you haven't looked at, you must go look at it after this. Actually, it's uh, no longer a gem. You now install it. But uh, Vagrant is a tool that will help you manage VirtualBox instances. The really nice thing about Vagrant for, from our perspective is it's fully integrated with Chef. So I can use Vagrant instances, so VMs running locally, to write out, test my Chef recipes. But I can also take my chef recipes from production and apply them directly to these vagrant virtual boxes that are running on developers' machines. So if a developer moves from one application to another, it literally takes vagrant up to spin up a local development environment for that developer. We've got a number of different applications. So the thing that we did is we let the vagrants gather. The operations team created a, a repo that we call the hobo jungle. That's essentially a collection of vagrant files so that as developers move from application to application, they know exactly where to go to get the right vagrant file. If we're going to be uh, spinning up branches and running branches, we need to test every branch. Yes? Why don't you have your vagrant files in your app? I'm sorry? Okay, so the question is, why don't we have the Vagrant file within the application? We sure could. Uh, great question. Uh, so we've used Tobo Jungle, or we've consolidated them all. Uh, I, I don't see a... It, it doesn't, actually. The Hobo Jungle... So the, the other question was, does Hobo Jungle include the chef? No, they're completely separate. Um, so the reason is we want to make sure that we can stay on the top tier of GitHub organizations and pay GitHub as much money as possible. So we've got plenty of repos, so we're good there. <clears throat> so the other thing that we have to do is we have to test every branch. So we use Jenkins as our uh, test platform. What we did was integrate Jenkins with Capistrano so that it's very easy for our developers right from the command line. They don't have to go to the Jenkins interface. They can just use cap Jenkins create. I've created a topic branch, cap Jenkins create. Now there's a Jenkins job that's building that branch. And I know when that branch is green and can be merged back into master. So we've built in some uh, nice little helper methods within Capistrano. With all of these topic branches in Jenkins and all of these different applications in Jenkins, we need an easy way for everyone to be aware of the current status of each one of these topic branches. So we use a tool called Green Screen, which is essentially a big visible chart that shows us the status of Jenkins. Uh, it's a very simple Sinatra app. We have it uh, available. It's, we have a fork of it available on our GitHub repo. You're welcome to go grab that. 
Here's a screenshot of green screen. This is the happy screenshot of green screen. Everything is built and passed and happy. Uh, so what we do is we actually mount this on a monitor within the development office so that everybody has full access to this, you know, can look at it at any time. Uh, this in yellow shows a build that had previously failed but is currently rebuilding so that, of course, the intent is that that will turn green. So we've changed our process. We've automated for disposable servers. We've got easy development environments, and we're testing every single branch as we go. But uh, I've mentioned a bunch of times uh, that we have a number of different apps. How many apps does it actually take to print a T-shirt? You might be asking yourself. Uh, so this is a, a slide that shows a couple of applications that we uh, manage. And all of these applications, I think there's eight or nine on the screen here, are involved in the process before the customer actually purchases a T-shirt. So we've got an application that runs the main website, a separate application that does our design lab, yet a separate application for the artwork in our design lab, and so forth. At the end of the day, I manage probably somewhere uh, in the mid-20s number of applications in production, so around 20, 25 applications in production. We deploy these apps using Capistrano, of course. Most of these applications are Rails applications and get deployed with Capistrano. This led to some problems, though. We have lots of identical deploy logic in each one of the applications, right? So spinning up a new application oftentimes meant copying a bunch of Capistrano recipes from one application to the next, modifying them slightly. We needed a way to streamline this. <clears throat> so we found CapHub. CapHub is a framework that works with Capistrano, basically sits on top of Capistrano, and it allows you from one uh, Cap Hub repo to define all of your different applications and you can deploy from there. So very similar to what we've done with Hobo Jungle, we have a separate uh, Cap Hub repository that we manage and we can go to the command line and say Cap Apps e-commerce deploy, fulfillment deploy. Makes it very easy for us to share deploy logic across all of these applications. And we don't put that in with our uh, applications because there's no need to have Capistrano recipes running in production or stored on the production boxes. We can keep those completely out of uh, the application's repos. The other thing that we found was if we needed to make a change to the deploy recipe, that would kick off a Jenkins build, which isn't going to actually change anything about the application the way that it runs. So moving that out of the rep repository for the applications made a ton of sense. So now that we've got our application or our change, off in a branch, it's built, it's ready to be deployed. The process that we follow, you merge your branch into master, you build it, you deploy it, you verify it, and then you get out of the way because someone is right behind you ready to deploy. We manage this process using the topic in our campfire room. Uh, other companies will use the topic on an IRC chat and so forth. Uh, we were certainly inspired by Etsy for this. So this is how our topic might look. On the far left-hand side, you see the developer Andrew has a ticket that he's ready to deploy or actually has deployed. Uh, and then Stafford's lined up next. Andrew's got another change and so forth. So once your name gets to the front of the queue, that's your sign that you are now ready to merge into master, deploy your own changes, verify them in production, and then take yourself off of the list. We utilize our product managers to help with sequencing when it matters. Sequencing doesn't always matter, but when it does, we let our product managers help with that. <clears throat> Once a deploy goes out, we have to announce the deploy. We have a, a sort of a legacy uh, announcement mechanism that we've been using. So uh, back in the olden times and even today, when a deploy goes out, there's an internal blog that needs to be updated. Uh, an email needs to be sent to a bunch of people. We update a Google spreadsheet. There's a lot of ceremony around that. That kind of sucks, but we've automated it all away so that when you do cap deploy, all of this happens. We actually post a change log into our campfire room so that all of the other devs know exactly what just went out. Um, we automate everything. So we've done a really good job of just reducing the friction, making it much easier to get things out and into production uh, through all of these mechanisms. We changed our process. We automated for disposable servers, eased our development environments, test everything, 
we stay on topic with our deploy train, and we automate the ceremony away. So what's changed? We've, or what are some of the uh, benefits that we've realized? Well, we have certainly minimized the amount of work and process. That was a huge deal for us. It no longer takes two weeks for us to change the word happy to glad on the website. We can do that in mere minutes. Uh, we have much shorter cycle times, fewer integration bugs. The other thing that's changed though is people get really, really agitated, really unhappy when a deploy takes a while. When, a, when the deploy, you know, we deployed something out, there was something wrong with it, we did have to pull that back and fix it, but I was next on the list and I'm ready to go right now. I might have to wait two hours. That really sucks. I have to wait two hours to get my stuff into production. Um, we absolutely deploy one thing at a time. It makes it very easy for us to know and verify that the thing that we put out didn't cause any problems and actually works as we expected. Everyone deploys. No longer does the operations team have to be the one that does the cap deploy. It's back on the developers. You deploy your own stuff. You built it. You're in the mindset. Get it out there. Make sure that it works. I'm not going to call you up you know, six hours after you wrote the code to say something broke and I don't know what. And rollbacks are certainly now the exception. I think I have a question in the back. Great, sure. So the question was, how does all of this tie in with QA? The developer pulls something off the list, gets it done, it then goes to QA, and QA says, good to go, and then we deploy it out. It's very easy, the way that, the way that we manage this. We don't have QA. Uh, so our developers do all of their own QA, uh, and it's all managed through the build, uh, and what the developer and the product manager who verifies those changes, so in the traditional sense of uh, QA, you know, what you might think of as a separate QA team, we do not have that. Uh, that's not to say we don't test anything, of course, right? We just don't have a dedicated team to QA. Uh, in fact, that's kind of one of the challenges that we're looking at now is, does it make sense for us to introduce a team that can do that sort of QA? And if we do, how do we introduce them in such a way that it doesn't slow down this process? We want to keep things as frictionless as possible. Uh, so. If you have thoughts and ideas on that, I'd love to chat afterwards. So how can you get started? I strongly encourage you to look at the process. Uh, are you doing things that intentionally introduce delay to your deployment process? Are there things that you can cut out? Are there reasons why you're waiting that are unnecessary? Look at your culture. Certainly. Um, the company culture, not just within development, not just within operations, but the broader company culture has to be sort of willing to sign up for this. They have to understand the benefits of deploying more frequently. Uh, you may be uh, in a place where the idea of a, a deploy once a quarter is that's just how we do things. You have to go and change that mindset. That may require you going outside of the engineering organization. You have to automate everything. Automate, automate, automate. Um, it doesn't matter if you use Chef or Puppet or CF Engine or whatever you want. Use something uh, and automate the heck out of everything that you do. Enable everyone. It's not just the operations team that can hit the deploy button. It has to be the development team. They, can, they have to be able to take ownership of getting their code into production. They also have to have credentials to New Relic so that they can, after they've deployed their code, can go log into New Relic and watch did I just impact performance on the site in a negative way or in a positive way? You also have to use the right tools. Uh, and I'm going to tell you what some of those right tools are. The right tools. So first, listen. Listen to each other. Development, operations, it's a team. You have to talk to one another. You have to listen to one another. You have to look at the culture of your company. You have to use things like conversations, collaboration. You cannot do any of this stuff in a bubble, right? You have to work together. And again, it's outside of the engineering organization. It's engineering, it's operations, it's within the business you have to work as well. Some other tools that we use. Uh, of course, we use Git and GitHub. 
Uh, if you're still on SVN, I'm sorry. Uh, definitely move to Git. Uh, when I first came to Custom Inc., we were still using SVN, and it was not fun. Uh, although Git SVN is helpful. Uh, Vagrant, if you have not used Vagrant, go to vagrantup.com today, get it, you will be very happy. You can run your production environment locally on your Mac or on your Windows box or whatever. Chef is a great tool. Uh, it's also got a great community. Um, check that out. Of course, Jenkins, you all know Jenkins. Uh, green screen, there's a link in the slides, of course. Uh, if you go to Custom Inc.'s GitHub repo, you'll be able to download green screen. It's uh, definitely beneficial to have that within your engineering office. Of course, Campfire or something like that. Uh, Capistrano and CapHub are both available on GitHub as well. And thanks, that's what I have.